Hello, everybody. It is great to be here. My name is Gary Fowler, and welcome to another exciting edition of GSD Presents Silicon Valley AI and Tech from the heart of Silicon Valley. I'm here in Palo Alto. So it's with uh, great pleasure that I have Alex Balderstone as my guest. Many of people uh, know me. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done 17 startups, been involved in two unicorns. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion and also EBITDA.ai. So with that, I'd like to bring Alex in and let's talk about you're the European ecosystem and hot startups. Alex, how are you today? I'm very good, Gary. It's great to see you. How are you? I'm great. You know, busy like ever, you know, up at four o'clock in the morning, judging uh, competitions all over the world. So I feel like it's midday. So how are you doing today? I'm very good. I'm much the same over here at the moment. I think, you know, keeping busy till the end of the year at the moment. That's what we want to do. So. so tell me a little bit about, you know, so what's happening and, you know, how did you get involved in startups? Where did it, did one day you say, oh, I'm going to do startups. It sounds interesting. How did that happen? So, yeah, so I do two things, Gary. I, I, I'm the CEO, one of the co-founders at a company called Kaiku. We're an AI scouting platform for about 300 VCs uh, worldwide. We're backed by Startup Wise Guys, Europe's biggest B2B accelerator, and one of the biggest B2B investors over here. Uh, that's where most of my time goes with our team. And then a small part of my time is managing the portfolio of Birmingham Enterprise Community Accelerator, which is one of the biggest uh, regional accelerators here in the UK. Um, where, does, where, do, where do I get this from? Um, you know, many, many years of running smaller projects. I spent a lot of time in France, Switzerland, and Spain. Um, working in a number of different startup ecosystems over here. Um, it was really one of my co-founders, um, Trishna, in fact, who used to do a lot of work with the likes of Crunchbase and funded gun vehicles and things like that, um, that really brought us to try to look at the European funding scene and looking how fragmented it is um, and trying to bring more of that together. Now, it's super. So, you know, I've been to Birmingham, by the way. I, so yeah, oh, that's used yeah, to me. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Well, I actually lived in London. I lived in uh, South Sussex Mews, yeah. and uh, we had a uh, one of the manor houses down there. Yeah. And I'm I bringing to... you from Birmingham now, so yeah. that's where I am at this moment. Really? No, I love yeah. the place. It was beautiful, actually. Only thing that was tough is I had not driven on the roads in the UK before. You know, and I went, I rented a car and I went around those roundabouts. And it was extremely terrifying. Confusing. Yeah, Absolutely terrifying. I don't know if you had that. Have you if you've driven in the U.S. But for me, it was like I the U.S. You just keep going, right? You know, it's just long roads. You go, 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 and it was like, where does this thing stop? And when am I going to get killed? <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope not, and I'm still fine. So, <laughs> no, it's fun. fantastic. So this, you know, with Kaiku, what's happening? You know, I can feel the fervor of the European ecosystem. Today, I was involved in a uh, pitching competition. And I got to tell you, Alex, the quality of the companies that I've seen over the last year, year and a half, is dram they've dramatically improved. I think part of it's because of the pandemic. People were locked down and wanted to, they needed to work on something. But it's just incredible. And, you know, it is uh, hot. It's, so it's, it's hotter than it's ever been. It's hotter than it's ever been. And I think you've just summed it up. But, you know, the main thing I always say to people is every country and every part of Europe has a different ecosystem. So, you know, if we're looking here in the UK and in London, we're obviously the hub of most VC investment that comes over here. But we're powered by a lot of tax incentives in the UK, uh, which doesn't happen worldwide. So, you know, most early stage investors get about 50 percent of their money back. And then over a certain amount, that becomes 30 percent. And a lot of our single purpose vehicles over here are structured in a way where their LP investments allow that. Uh, but it does mean you have to have your companies in the UK to be able to benefit from that as well. But we go all the way from there, all the way to Eastern Europe, which I know you know very well as well. Um, which is where our investors, in fact, Startup Wise guys come from Estonia. They originally were the engineering team, some of the guys behind it at Skype, um, and set up looking to involve, I suppose you'd say, the Baltic funding scene. And they've really mastered that since then as well. But they've come out to Lithuania, Latvia, and have conquered a lot of uh, you know, Central and Eastern Europe as well. But the great thing there is, obviously, a lot of the tech costs over there are damn sight cheaper than what you're doing in the UK and, and in the US. Um, so the ability to hire... You know, the ability to put a lot more money into R&D is a lot more plentiful over there as well. But it doesn't go about saying a lot of the, the funds that are over there, if we take Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, 
a lot of their a lot of the VCs there have money from the European Commission, the European Bank of Restructuring and Development. And that there are mandates that aren't always the most flexible. The a lot of red tape that mean they have to invest locally. It is getting better, um, but we still have a pretty, I suppose you say, domestic view in Europe. Uh, France is a good example of that. I used to live in Paris, got involved in Station F quite a lot. Uh, very big startup space over there. And as you well know, you've got to focus on France when you're there. And that can be tricky if you're a foreigner coming in. And it, it, again, it's getting better. Um, but it really depends on the national ecosystem that you're in. You know, I don't see many French startups. I, I got to tell you, I, I see a lot of startups. Once in a while, I'd love to see more French startups. I don't know. They, I mean, where are they? In France. <laughs> I mean, oh, big... okay. <laughs> Duh. I think. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean. We've had we've had a ton of great funds come out of Paris. You know, Kima Ventures is, is testament to that, and you know a lot of their portfolio as well diversifies. But uh, you know, a great example was you know Kaiku could have been started at Station F, and this is one of the world's largest startups places, and was a big part of what Macron Emmanuel Macron's been trying to do to make funding easier there, to you know to make fundraising easier as well. But France is a prime example of you've got to master the language, you've got to master the French market before you leave. Um, and, you know, we see a lot, you know, if we take the DAC region, Germany, Austria, Switzerland as well, you know, similar with N26, for example, you know, very strong, obviously, in, in their domestic markets. But once they've looked at the US and the UK, it's been, a, it's you know, so there have been some successes, to say the least, but they, they, they do tend to do a lot better in their own domestic territories. Yeah, you know, the thing is, if we look at it now, it's like the democratization of opportunity, right? I mean, you can go global. And one of the things I know, I, I started a company in the UK and uh, I tried to get funded. It was really difficult at the time to get funded. So I moved it over to Silicon Valley, you know, set up as U.S. corporation. All of a sudden, everything changed and it was a great idea and the investors got it. And, you know, part of the challenge and I, it's getting a lot better, but having the, it's not about the startups having, you know, they have incredible talent, but it's having the investors that understand what they should invest in or not. Right. But I think this is, you know, this is testament to why the EU is a great place to be at the moment, regardless of whatever country that you're going into, because as you all know better than most, there's a lot of uh, US money coming into the European scene and in the UK scene as well. Sequoia Scout program, one of their scouts, Roxanne's the director of Station S, for example. Once you've got a network like that and you're getting the signals of where the pre-seed startups are coming up, that's the problem historically that we've obviously always had over here. Who is willing to put the earliest check sizes in? Um, and, we, you know, we've seen a bit of that restructuring in the last few days, what Sequoia is doing and changing its structures to become a little bit more, I suppose you could say, like a bank. You know, can we produce more services? Maybe it's a bit more like SVB, Silicon Valley Bank in that respect, to be able to be going through. And we are getting better. But unfortunately, there are countries in Europe that lag behind that. We as Kaiku love working with a lot of companies from Holland and Portugal, for example. Testament that you know we've got Web Summit next week over in Lisbon. Wait a minute, Holland and Portugal. Now, is it because you like to vacation in Portugal or what? Well, I, I, <laughs> both of my <laughs> land. <laughs> I'm off to I'm off to Amsterdam. In fact, this Saturday. Um, uh, okay. but we we just find the space is very international, and we you know ease of business. If you're a foreign start, Portugal for in Spain, for example, if you're coming from Latin America, language is obviously one thing. It's easier for the funds to go invest and understand the the culture and everything else coming in, but much easier a lot of government grants a lot of government incentives and east business you know going through that as well um i had to set up a company for kaiku in italy last year for a few investment reasons um and again you know draghi's government over there is putting a lot of money into the space and it's great there's a lot of lp uh, you know public lp investment into private fund vehicles but time will tell where all that will go as well is it going into the right places there are a lot of countries that are changing these regulations but there is a real long time to see actually what the effect will be no, I, I agree with you. But this is the greatest time. I mean, you know, I remember actually StreamYard 2018 Zoom when I was one of the original uh, only a couple of years ago. Right. It seems like forever. People said, why would you use Zoom? We have Skype. And I said, because it's a lot better. Why do you need that? You can just meet the person in person. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, but now, you know, think about it. It's really level the playing field. And we're what we're finding is we're finding. You know, I was I've worked in Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. I spent actually lived in Latvia for some time. And there's incredible opportunities. It's a matter of mining those opportunities. I think you're right about Estonia. Estonia, because of the Skype connection, 
I mean, there were tax advantages too, right? Coming from Sweden down to Estonia. So, you know, Estonia is a great example. I mean, I was over there in August um, at Startup Day. I mean, I don't expect many people have heard of Startup Day, but it's one of the biggest conferences in the Baltic. It is the biggest conference in the Baltic region. And it's testament to Estonia, I'll probably get the number wrong, has got seven unicorns. Latvia and Lithuania have one each. But the thing is, Estonia is probably one of the easiest nations to open a company in. Everything's digitized. All the public services are online. And if we look at the money easies, the transfer wise, pipe drives, they all started there. And there's, there's so much money now being reinvested back into the region um, and sort of domestic market. This is why we're seeing it coming up. And again, you know, not many people know, for example, pipe drives second biggest market to Brazil. Monashi is a massive fund over there, led one of their rounds as well. And you, know, you really can go anywhere. Once you crack that, if you, as long as you've got the scalable software and the team behind it, you know, the opportunities are endless. Yeah, I know. I talked to one of the founders of Pipedrive. I had him on, and you know, Esto- but Estonia is not a big place. It's got what a population no more than a couple million, right? You can walk across Tallinn, uh, which I have done in a pretty quick time. <laughs> it's <laughs> a pretty quick, pretty quick time. So you know, the, the, and that's where the beauty of it is. What it means, Alex, is that any country, as long as they're focused, you know, like Israel, right? like Estonia, if a country's focused and instead of getting wrapped around the red tape, they focus on how to create companies, they can change it. I just spoke at the UN a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Technology is a tool for peace. And I talked about technology companies that we see all over the world, including Africa, that actually are going down through and creating jobs. All right? So if you want to stop people from you know, doing a heinous acts, go down through and create jobs where people can feed their family. And and that changes. I'm sure you've seen that in Estonia, and I've seen it in Latvia and Lithuania a bit, but it's it is true. But absolutely. And I mean, testament to that, we've obviously got COP next week in the UK, in Glasgow. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the market will say at the moment, most of the next unicorns are going to come up in the climate tech space because, no, one, you know, we're not doing enough there. And we really do need to understand a lot more about what we can do there as well. But, you know, Glasgow is going to be the hub for this all next week. Now, Without getting too political and talking about Brexit, which is something in the UK we try not to talk about anymore, um, ease of business over here hasn't changed. We've still got, if you spend 100k on tech, you will get a third of that back through R&D tax relief. I mean, not many countries have that. We've got the early stage investment relief. We have a very good decentralised government system of local grant money in the UK called the Local Enterprise Partnership Scheme. And, you know, hey, you know, yes, I have had some difficulties working between the EU and the UK. That's natural. Uh, You know, London's other financial services and fintech. Um, but I, in my opinion, not much has changed in that respect. Kind of interesting. You know, and you're right about climate change. This thing, why did Glasgow get picked? I mean, it, what happened? How did that, I mean, is it is it a really green, um, you know, uh, in, environment and, and political situation? I mean, what, what happened? I wish I knew that, Gary. <laughs> I wish I really it's, knew that. It's interesting for me. It's like, you know, because you're right about it, Alex. Look at this. By 2050, we're going to have to double the food supply on the planet to feed everybody. And we can't increase the number of livestock because 26% of the emissions today are from livestock. At the same time, by the end of this century, the average temperatures around the world could be up as high as 7 degrees Fahrenheit. People say, well, what does that mean? That means you got a couple of feet of uh, sea level increase and nothing good's going to happen. But the good thing is, at least we're seeing, from a funding perspective, more money going here at the pre-seed. So APX, a very big fund vehicle over in Berlin, Porsche and Axel Springer's fund vehicle. Again, more portfolio in this space. Entrepreneur First, very big talent program over here in London and worldwide, moving more there as well. Um, a very similar fund in, in terms of way which Draper works, um, Augmented FinTech, now focusing a lot more on climate tech investments as well. Again, larger tickets, and that's where the money needs to be able to go. So, again, the follow on can come with that. You know, here's the other thing that's really interesting. In the last couple, in the last month, I've had some of the uh, top family offices from the, the wealthiest family offices, right? The, the name brand contact us and about early stage startups. It's really, really interesting. You wouldn't think that some of those families would be that interested. I don't know if you're seeing the same thing, but the you know the second, third, fourth generation, sixth generation of one of those families, um, I mean, they're focused on making a dent and they're looking for companies in AI, quantum ha- that have impact. Are you seeing the same thing? And it's really interesting you raise that. So for us at Kaiku, we focus on three markets: smaller VCs, what we call tier two to four funds, CVC corporate venture capital, and the family office space. And on that point, on family offices, it is exactly what we're seeing. 
more families moving more away from the typical asset management, the growth stage towards that early stage and taking more risk and diversifying that portfolio as well. And again, the reason we do what we do is to help those fund vehicles invest across borders. So they may not have a fund team. They may have a few principals or a few investment managers in one country in, I don't know, say Holland or Switzerland, whatever, but not an operational team in the UK. So we try and act as a bit of an extension them to understand the market, gain some of their feedback and, and try and improve what they come through. But as you say, it's testament to where the family office market is moving. Now, it is pretty secretive still. And I think, you know, you will find a lot of offshore entities. And that's, you know, that just comes with the nature of the beach. Yeah, you know, it is really but, secretive. You know, it's the when we have a meeting with the folks, it takes, well, at least 10 meetings to really figure out who the family is. I don't know if it's like that with you. It's like, I feel like, ah, we, you know, we're, we're, we're like the wizard of Oz. All of a sudden the curtains open up and, and you figure out who the family is, but they're not really forthcoming. A lot of times they come out at a different angle. It's hard to crack. It's, it's hard to crack, but actually uh, one thing I always recommend people read is uh, SVB Silicon Valley bank did a really good family office report last year. Um, authored by, I believe it was Barry O'Brien, the head of family office practice there, where most of them are uh, essentially saying, I think it's six out of 10, I do believe at the moment, most of the returns are going to come from emerging fund managers. And that is essentially why they are moving um, to that space. I have to get that from uh, Vera Shokina. I have to yeah. get that copy of that. Uh, is it online or, or where? Yeah, I think it is online. I have seen it publicly, yes. So, um, okay, it's, so it's, every, it's the audience read. out there, check it, take a look at it. That could be a good read. No, it's I hear, a good read. I hear, I agree with you 100 percent. And it's really interesting because, I, you know, it seems like the family offices are afraid of getting left out. You know, I hear about Bitcoin, too. They talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, too, a lot now. And blockchain. Well, we're lacking a lot of that regulation over here as well. So we're we're not we haven't caught up completely there. So. So the um, so um, conference in Glasgow, what else is happening? What countries, if you were to name the top three in the European Union, you know, the. Uh, Estonia, of course, but where do you really see the uh, entrepreneurial activity? Where is it really the hottest? Um, this is without me being biased at this point. I mean, I, I, I definitely put Portugal up there as one. I mean, we've got Web Summit next week. I think they're up just about, I saw, is it Paddy, the, the, the founder, say they're just about capacity today. I mean, the quality of speakers that go over, um, the, the quality of what you can get from there as well is great. The ease of business, there are reliefs uh, that help a lot of startups and we're seeing, as I said, more and more from Brazil and LATAM come into the region as well. Um, Estonia, as you said, is definitely on that list from east of business, just from more money. But the great thing is, you know, from the TransferWise IPO over in London on, on the London Stock Exchange, a lot of that money is making a lot of internal millionaires as well. But the thing is, they're investing that money back in. Um, and I, I, I would obviously have to put the UK on that map. And for me, we're still part of Europe. Um, that, that is a big thing. Um, as I say, we've got, this is a company that I always recommend people look at. It's called Boban, B-A-U-B-A-N. They have essentially democratized how people set up fund vehicles. So actually, you know, we're talking about family offices. It's now super easy, super cheap, like say cheap compared to how it used to be um, to set up a private vehicle and to, to do direct investments out of that. Um, so those would tend to be three of my main areas. As I say, I'm going to the Netherlands on the weekend and I think there's a lot of, lot of potential there as well. But a lot of a lot of Europe's still segmented. Say Italy's getting a lot better, but it's going to take a lot of time um, in terms of moving through. That why is, is pretty- it, Alex? Why is Italy? I mean, these countries is it because of infrastructure, because they didn't focus on startups. I mean, you know, what? Is, why did the you know countries? Is it because they just didn't have the governmental support or? So this has been a big thing of Mario Draghi, and uh, as m- many people will know, Mario Draghi used to head up the European Central Bank over here, and he's now you know, leading leading sort of Italian government on all of this sort of stuff. And it's more they in the UK, for example, we have a, a public fund vehicle called British Business Bank. In Italy, they have one called CDP, um, which are putting a lot of money into funds, new funds, new accelerators, trying to bring new companies from outside into the ecosystem to exploit the market. Um, as I say, the tax reliefs are new and there's a lot of people trying it. Now, there is a question in a few years, are people going to start digging up what's been happening? Are there a lot of shell companies and things like that? But, you know, I think that's to, that's to be seen. Um, Spain's a great example as well, but there's a lot of local investment um, that, that happens there. Eastern Europe, again, great potential. As I said, Wise Guys is, is a leader in that space of investing in, but there's a lot of local money. And so there are still restrictions on what can what can come out of that? I mean, if we take UiPath, for example, which Early Bird invested into, another good example of that, those guys took, I believe, I think the, the story is about 10 years to get to about a million 
in, in revenue before they really started taking off and saying, what can we use our software for to scale? Um, and Chen, one of the early bird partners who we had in for an event in London the other week, said exactly the same thing. But you are getting more of these you know, diamonds in the rough that are coming out. Um, and if a U.S. fund gets that, um, you know, the valuations are going to be matching that. Well, you know, you're right about it. And uncovering those diamonds in the rough. I know we're in Africa. I'll be in Egypt in a couple of weeks. And the kind of diamonds that are out there, people don't, you know, Nigeria, for instance, in fintech, yeah. people don't get it. I mean, there's incredible talent around the planet. I mean, you know, we got to go down through two, Alex, and help each other. The one, you know, when I, I did my speech at the uh, UN, it started out the at the UN uh, it was, uh, well, you know, it was uh, AR and VR as a tool to combat violent extremism and terrorism. Then it morphed into, you know, training systems to identify terrorists, et cetera. And I said, guys, I think you got it wrong. Let's figure out how we can work together. And I, my thing was- How can they take that? <laughs> You're wrong. Well, they didn't. <laughs> you know, I said, technology is a tool for peace. I mean, I don't work for them. So right. I, I mean, I came in because they're very nice people and I figured out, the way we got to do this, just like we're doing now, is connect the dots and figure out how we can help those companies so we can create jobs, create a spirit, focus people in different directions to make, you know, let's solve. We got challenges with global warming. You know, the the average temperatures are going to go up, but the population of the planet is going to go from 8 billion to 13 billion, right? The the um, I worked on a weather startup a number of years ago, and we talked about the day the Gulf Stream uh, stops right, and they and I remember Dr. Crick, who had done. He actually studied under Albert Einstein. I met him many years ago, back in the early '90s. I did this project, not to date myself, but Dr. Crick was telling me he said that Gary, you're going to know when it starts to snow in the UK, and he said it'll start snowing more and more. And I remember at the time I'd never heard of snow in the UK, and then all of a sudden it starts snowing. So we got to go down through and work together. We've got challenges. We're not going to have oil and natural gas. It's going to run out. You know, we've reached peak in a lot of ways. So we got to figure out how to, to use the resources around us to be able to survive. And it's going to take us really banding together on an international level to do it. So we got to bring these country, countries in. There's incredible mindsets out there to help, you know, solve the challenges. Absolutely. And, you know, it's next week. In fact, I've got a meeting uh, with one of the representatives from an organization called Corfo. Corfo in Chile, um, or one of the, or the vehicle that backs Startup Chile, which is Latin America's obviously original and, and leading accelerator down there as well. But he, that individual's in London before they go up to COP and we're saying the same thing. You know, how can we do more of this? And we've seen this recently with um, CMPC and other Chilean companies, one of the world's largest pulp and paper producers. Corporate venture vehicle, again, trying to look, where can we go into forestry? Where can we go into agro? And so we are aware that people are trying to go into this as well. Mm -hmm. But again, we've got to have some form of pressure that allows this to go out. And then again, we've got national infrastructure, unfortunately, in 27 EU member states, which stops a lot of this actually moving through, unfortunately. so No, I agree. And, you know, this, this I don't know if you're experiencing this, but the, the we see data, right? The problem is, we're in on data with data acts, right? We have 49 zettabytes of data on the planet. If we took CDs or DVDs and stacked them one on top of another, go 35 times between Earth and the moon. And I talk about this a lot, but the problem is we're in a state of infobesity. So it doesn't matter really who you are or where you are. We have the same problems. Think about this. Each one of us has about 300,000 items in the personal cloud. Uh, the entire web in 1996 was 257,000 websites. You, Alex, have more information uh, in your own personal cloud, the entire web. The challenge is that number doubles every year. In five years, it's going to be 10 million items because the Internet of Things. Think about this. In the last two weeks, how many times has somebody said, Alex, I sent you a message? Did you say, where did you send it? I sent it to your email. Which one? Uh, I think I sent it to Gmail. No, Yahoo, your old address. When did you send it? I sent it a week and a half ago. Will you send it again? I can't find it. Yeah, and then my so now, email doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. And it's hard because you got to have the exact spelling. So we've got to come up with an entirely new paradigm, an entirely new way to be able to understand data. You know, I don't, you know, I'm looking at companies that have AI and machine learning, deep learning to be able to solve these complex problems because, you know, we talk about food, farming 4.0. If we're going to have to really optimize, we're going to feed people. And part of it is having, IOT and drones and self-driving tractors to be able to help us. 
do you see that? Do you see uh, AI? Do you see, are you seeing more and more uh, companies of machine learning and deep learning or, or what, what do you think? I think there's two parts of the question. I mean, I think the first is what are we doing with all the data over here? And uh, I spent a lot of time on stakeholder sessions, other, you know, embassies and, and a lot of this stuff. And it's generally too much talking, not enough action. And I think that's, you know, pretty concurrent, but, you know, especially in the UK. And again, we see a lot of that in Europe because it's 27 member states. They all want to do different things and to get a, you know, a unilateral sort of agreement is pretty damn hard to do that at the same time. Uh, you know, whoever's used deal room or crunch base will definitely find in certain parts of the world a lot less data. And that's why it's so hard to actually make those early stage investment decisions. Same in Africa. A lot of people are making it better as well. Deep learning wise. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, one nuance of that is what we're trying to do is trying to get a little bit more of the feedback about what funds are looking at. And look, we know that will take a damn long time. Um, but, you know, we're, we're well into what we're doing there to try and improve what's coming through. But again, you know, we could take this from an agro perspective. We could take this from a climate tech perspective. Um, I don't think he'd mind mentioning a friend of mine recently graduated from Entrepreneur First. He's got a climate tech um, company called Connect Earth that I recommend everyone looks at. But, you know, part of this is essentially built easy APIs to be able to access banking data and a lot of other data to be able to then understand user trends about how we can reduce this. Um, and we know a lot of, you know, if you look at Revolut, a lot of them are trying to build in a lot of this as well. But again, how much are the users actually using this and how much can we actually, you know, do something useful and meaningful with this? Yeah, I mean, we have to do something useful and meaningful. That our data is really well, we <laughs> it's about our data, right? I mean, our lives are about data. And I think we're going to start controlling our own data. It's going to move away from, you know, the Google and Facebooks of the world where we're going to have value in our data It'll be tokenized at some point in time. It's going to be fascinating how it how it changes. And then, you know, unsupervised and semi-supervised AI helping us to make decisions. Uh, I believe there are going to be intelligent assistants, Alex, that are a little bit different. That'll be kind of like your grandmother. That'll have empathy and compassion and help you, whether it's working with your doctors, uh, working with, uh, you know, helping with drive your car. I mean, all kinds of different ways, like a guardian angel. And I believe I, I see some of those, the first signs of that coming to fruition, but it's going to be beautiful when that, when that, uh, when that happens. So we're coming to the uh, top of the show, Alex, closing thoughts and how can people reach you? Uh, I'm very easy to reach. Um, it's Alex at Kaiku, K-A-I-K-U.co and always happy to talk to anyone looking at anything over the European and wider scene as well. Wider thoughts. I mean, I think we're, nothing's going to change over here in the UK. I think we're going to keep being a spearheading uh, in terms of what we're doing with funding as well. But I think we're going to see more and more European startups launch into the US, land into the US, and again, more of that money coming over here as well. Um, I do think the rest of Eastern Europe will catch up with all of this. I think the gap's getting smaller and smaller. Um, but, you know, I, I think everything's going really in the right direction. Yeah. No, that's great. And how do people reach out to you? They can go on the Kaiku website, kaiku.co. That's our website. And you'll if you put my name in front of the domain, you'll get to me. So. Sounds great. Listen, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be on my show today. To my audience out there, my name is Gary Fowler. And I am the host of GST Presents Silicon Valley AI and Tech. You can check me out. I've got uh, several shows that are uh, out there. Love to hear from me. You can reach me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And as always, stay happy, stay safe. And stay healthy. Go get them and stay positive. See you again next week. I'll be back on Tuesday with another exciting edition of GST Presents Silicon Valley AI and Tech. Thanks, Alex. Take care. Thanks, Gary. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.